Today being Christmas, we already know is the time to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Our Lord and Savior was born about 2,000 years ago. We cannot say exactly it was December 25th, but this is the time that has been selected by believers to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and it has been done for years. And so we, we set it as a time to remember the birth of the Lord. But this morning, I want to go beyond, go farther back before that time that Jesus was born. And I want to go to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. The prophet spoke about Jesus who would be born about 700 years later. And so if we read from verse 1, which I will read up until verse 7, it gives you a context of this man and the people around the time Jesus would be born. And the context is that of judgment and darkness and gloom and sorrow. But then when we get to verse 6 and 7, it tells us every one of those conditions will be changed. Why? Because of a son that is going to be born. Because of a child that is coming to the world. And so it is the coming of Jesus that changes everything for mankind. Chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The he here is God. All these nations and these places that are mentioned were places in Jerusalem, the people of God. And what we see there is their condition. God had decreed judgment on them because of their repeated rebellion against God. This is chapter 9. Chapter 7, God sent a messenger to the king of Israel at this time who was afraid because of two nations that were coming to invade this country. And God said, I'm going to deliver you from those nations. But I want you to ask me for a sign so you can know that I'm the one speaking to you. Out of rebellion, the king said, I'm not going to ask for a sign. And God said, that's fine, but I will give you a sign. And the sign is that a virgin shall conceive. Now, virgins do not conceive. But God says, I'm going to give you a supernatural sign. However, between that chapter and the chapter we are in, God also tells them that because of the nation's rebellion, continuous rebellion over their history, he's going to give them over to wicked nations that will come and judge them. And therefore, when you read verses 1 and 2, you are seeing these names of places being mentioned, and you are seeing people living in darkness. They are living in darkness because it's a, re it's a result of their sin and their rejection of God. But in the same breath, while God is talking about judgment, he's also talking about hope. And he says, but I will turn things around. I will turn from punishing you people of God, or that is the nation of Israel, because I'm going to send a savior to you, and it will turn your darkness to light. Not only will he do that, all the kings that have been leading the people of God that were imperfect, that were mortal beings, that were sinful kings themselves, he said, now I'm sending a savior who himself will become king. And when he becomes king, the government will rest upon his shoulder and everything under his rule will turn around. And so, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shone. When you read passages like this, you are seen in the past tense. But you have to understand that these things 
had not happened yet. As of this time, the prophecy was being spoken. But Isaiah, like many other prophets, they will see things God was about to do as if it is already past tense. And they will speak of it in the past tense, even though in this case, it was still 700 years ahead. And so what the prophet is saying here is that people of God and everyone in the world that lived in darkness because they don't have the knowledge of God, one day is coming when a light is going to shine on them. Everyone that walked in darkness, one day is coming that they will see the light of God. Everyone that dwell in the shadow of death, that means when, when, you are, when you say you are in the shadow of something, it means something is over you. People that dwell in the shadow of death, it means death, eternal death is looming over them. But it says one day it's going to be removed. Now, it also continues to say in verse, 20, verse 3, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. Those that dwell in sadness and sorrow, joy was about to come to them. They rejoice before you according to the joy of others as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Verse 4, those that were in yokes of burden, the yokes were about to be lifted. For you have broken the yoke of, the, of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. Number 4, in verse 5, everyone that was engaged in constant war, Verse 5 is telling them, peace is going to replace war. For every warrior's sandals from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. They will not need weapons of war anymore. They will just use them to, they will burn them to get energy because they don't need them. How are these things going to happen? The prophet was telling his people, we come to it in verse 6, because of for unto us, a child is born. Again, think of this. It's like unto us a child will be born. But the prophet is speaking in past tense even though it has yet to come. But now we can see it has happened. Unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder. The government was not going to be upon the shoulder of King Ahaz anymore. At this time, King Ahaz was the king over Israel. But many of them have messed up. God says, no longer will I give the government to be, to be ruled by human beings because they've always messed it up. Just look at the world around us. With all our sophistication, with all our technology, with all our education, with all the technology and the discoveries of the world, the world is in chaos more than it has ever been. There is no place you look on the map that doesn't have any problem. And so God was telling these people, he says, one day I'm sending a son and he will take over the government and he will carry the government on his shoulder. That's when things will turn around. All you have to do is turn on your TV and you see, you see incredible chaos and destruction in the world. But when this son comes, he will carry the government on his shoulder and here are his names. You know, in many cultures, names are very important. To the Hebrews, names are very important. Some of you listening to me, your name was given to you because of the circumstances uh, at the time you, have, you were born or what the parents were looking forward to. The name of Jesus, the first one here is, his name will be called Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Let's just stop right there. Our Lord and Savior that was born to us 2,000 years ago, Isaiah said his properties, his characteristics, the things that define him, one of them is this word wonderful. Now, wonderful here doesn't mean, oh, great. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's wonderful. No. This means something you cannot explain. It means something that is beyond human understanding. The one we celebrate today, his name is wonderful. Every aspect of his life is wonderful. 
Are we going to talk about his birth? He was born of a virgin. There is no man up until now that has been born of a virgin. There is no man that is born without the, the substance of a man and a woman coming together. It's impossible. But God said, I tell you, when the, the son that I'm going to send to the world is going to come, everything about him will be wonderful. In fact, his conception will be wonderful. He will be born by a virgin without mating with a man. That's one of the reasons it's wonderful. It's wonderful in his place of birth. Who have you seen that chose where they're going to be born? It's impossible. You just grow up to realize where you were born. But it's wonderful in that he chose where he was going to be born. In the book of Micah chapter 2, the prophet said he will be born in Bethlehem. Remember, Jesus is, is eternally existing. He was giving all this information to the prophets and to his people and saying, I am wonderful. I will tell you everything about me before I am born physically into the world. He was not only born by a virgin. He chose the place and the season where he was going to be born. He's wonderful. Not only that, he chose a forerunner that somebody is going to go before him six months before he was born, and they will be talking about him before he came. Who did you send to the world to talk about your birth before you came? <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, the only way we know people, somebody is coming to the world, is when the doctor tests the mother and says, well, you're pregnant. But this Jesus is so wonderful that he said in the book of Malachi, I'm going to send a man before me before I come. And guess what? Six months before Jesus came, John the Baptist came and he started talking about Jesus. That's why he's wonderful. Everything about Jesus is not what you can compare with man. Praise the Lord. He's wonderful in that when he was coming, he sent angels ahead of him. He said, go and tell them that I'm coming. Which other world religion, religious leader do you know of that angels who are just popping up everywhere and they were announcing Buddha is coming, Hare Krishna is coming, Muhammad is coming? Nowhere, no record. But when this wonderful Jesus was going to come, angels were showing up everywhere. They show up to Mary, they show up to Joseph, they show up to the shepherds, and they said, A Savior has been born. That's why his name is wonderful. It's wonderful in that not only did he send angels, he sent a star to the wise men from the east. And the Bible says they saw a star, and immediately by seeing the star, they recognized that this is not an ordinary star, and they followed the star, star hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles to the exact place where the child was born. Why? He's wonderful. Praise the Lord. That's why the first thing we are told about his name is that he's wonderful. He's wonderful in that he was born a king. Do you remember when the, the wise men came? They said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? If you see a baby and instantly there is a crown on the head of the baby when the baby is coming from the womb, you will run. Praise God. But without any physical crown on the head of baby Jesus, everybody knew that this is the king of the Jews. Not only that, the king of the world. Everything about Jesus is wonderful. They brought Gold, frankincense, and myrrh as gift to him, even though he was a baby. Because as a baby, he was a king. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful in his life. His life was full of miracles. Nature, nature obeyed Jesus. Do you, do you remember that? The life of Jesus, not only his birth, the, his entire life was full of wonders. He was the man that, that walked on the sea. Why? Because his name is wonderful. He was the man that turned just two fishes and five loaves of bread to, food, to feed thousands of people. Why? Because he is wonderful. He is beyond understanding. He is beyond any circumstance. He is beyond natural laws. He's wonderful because the Bible says the first miracle he did was he turned water to wine. And people were wondering, what kind of a man is this? Well, Isaiah chapter 9 told us the first characteristic of him is he's going to be wonderful in every area. This is the Jesus that we serve. He's wonderful in that this man, who is God-man, saw 
a man born without eyes. In the book of John chapter 9, born blind. <laughs> and Jesus says, come. And he, he, he spat on the ground. He, made, he molded some clay with his hand. The Bible says he pasted it on the face of this man. And he said, go and wash. And the man went to wash and the man came back seen. How do you explain that? Now, I'm not talking about a man that had cataract in his eyes or had some eye disease. He had no eyes from birth. But our wonderful Savior gave him two perfect, you know, uh, one perfect set of eyes. And this man, they started to ask him questions. How, are you sure you are born blind? He said, yes. So how come you see? He said, well, a man named Jesus told me to go and wash. I went to wash and I come see him. And they started questioning him. Then the man said, you know what? From the beginning of the world, we have never had it that a man was born blind and he now sees. But now, I know that I was once blind, but now I can see. You go figure that out. But a man called Wonderful gave me my eyes. So when, when, when the Jesus that you serve is wonderful in everything, not only his birth, in his life, his life was full of wonders. The Bible says there was a time when the disciples were on the sea and the storm was so much and water was coming into their boat and they were about to sink. And when Jesus said, when they woke up Jesus from the bottom of the, of the boat, he came up and he said, peace be still. And the storm kept quiet right away and everything ceased. And the people said, well, what kind of a man is this? Why? He's wonderful. That's the Jesus that we serve. Not only was he wonderful in his life, his teachings were wonderful. The Pharisees began to look at him. They said, well, we are students of the law of Moses, but we have never seen a man teach like this before. Luke chapter 4, verse 31 to 32. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Jesus was wonderful. If he can teach you things that no man can teach you. He's wonderful in his teaching. He's wonderful in his nature. Praise the Lord. He is God who became flesh. God who became man and did not stop to be God. Are you understanding me? God does not become anything because God is eternal. But when it comes to Jesus, God became human being. That means before that time, he was not human. Now, he became human being, but after becoming human being, he still maintained his essence as God. That's why he's wonderful. His nature is wonderful. There's no way you can explain it. John chapter 1, this is John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3, is, is a verse in the scripture that all kinds of uh, explanations and things have been made. And you know why? Because Jesus said, you cannot figure me out. I am wonderful. This Savior that we're worshiping you is not in the class of anybody else. Look at John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And if you keep on reading, the Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. His very nature is wonderful. As he's walking around, you see a human being, but as, at the same time, that is God that made the, the ground he's walking on. Hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. That is Jesus. He's wonderful. Hallelujah. Now, this means that if we can only get to a place where we can express the fullness of Jesus, our own lives will be full of wonders. That's what it means. Because the Jesus that you and I serve is full of wonders. Praise the Lord. Nothing stopped him. Nature 
could not put a limit on him. You cannot put him in a box and define him in one way because it transcends every, every line that you can draw. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful in that he lived in the world of sin and he was not a sinner. He didn't commit a single sin, but he was yet fully human being. That's why Isaiah says, we cannot figure him out. We cannot figure him out. All we can do is worship him. How many of us can say I've never sinned in the past 24 hours? Oh, 24 hours is too long. <laughs> in the past one hour. But Jesus lived 33 and a half years in the world, and the Bible says he was the perfect, sinless Lamb of God who had no sin, who knew no sin. That's why he's wonderful. Praise the Lord. It was wonderful in his death. How many here know exactly how they're going to die? Or when? But Jesus told his people exactly how he's going to die. And he told them what will happen after he dies. Why? He's wonderful. Many years before he came through David in Psalm 22, he said he would be crucified when crucifixion didn't exist as of yet. The Roman Empire had not come into power. They had not invented crucifixion. While David as king, we're talking about over a thousand years before Jesus, came and said a man, talking about Jesus, will be crucified. And Jesus came and fulfilled exactly that. Why? He's wonderful. Praise the Lord. He was wonderful in his resurrection. He said, build, destroy this temple, bring it down, and I will do what? I will build it up in three days. And everybody was looking at him. What do you mean? This temple, do you know how long it took Herod to build this temple? He was talking about his body. Who have you seen so far with all the advances that we have that has died, got into the grave, fully dead and resurrected? Not, not a single one up to date. But Jesus. Why? He's wonderful. Hallelujah. You know, one of the, one of the easiest things when it comes to somebody saying, well, is Jesus the only way or so is, you don't need to argue. All you got to do is, whoever is great in your eyes, show me their death certificate and their resurrection certificate. If you cannot show me, then there is no, there is no, there is no need for argument. Is it Muhammad? Can we go to his gravesite? His remains will be there. But Jesus is the only one that has an empty tomb. Because death could not hold him down. You know why? Because he was not a sinner. Sin has power, and the power is death. So death has power over everyone that sin. In the day you eat, you shall die. So anyone that dies is a proof that they were under the condemnation of sin. But the reason death could not hold Jesus back is that that just goes to show to you that he was not a sinner. Death could not hold him bound. But he was yet human being. How can you be a human being and not be a sinner? The answer is, it's wonderful. You cannot figure it out. Now, so not only was he wonderful in his, in his conception, wonderful in his life, wonderful in everything he did, he was wonderful in his death, he was wonderful in his resurrection, but he didn't stop there. And he told them, you will see the Son of Man ascending. And guess what? Forty days after he resurrected, what did he do? The Bible says, as he was talking to the disciples that gathered, and they were Acts chapter 1, they were looking at him, and he was being lifted up in their very eyes. This is not in a dream or in a trance. With their naked eyes watching him as he lifted up. There was no rocket. It's not rocket science here. Yeah. It's divine power lifting him up. And until he physically entered into the clouds and they didn't see him anymore. 
Why? Because he's wonderful. Are you understanding? So the Jesus that we serve, he is beyond anything that we can imagine, that we can think about, is beyond your mind, is beyond your circumstance, is beyond your problems, is beyond any issue that you may ever face, is beyond the answers to the questions that may be bogging your mind, is beyond any human being. There is no parallel. That comparison or any kind of comparison whatsoever between Jesus and anybody. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, everything is full of wonders. And guess what? He now says, just an angel told the people, he said, what are you watching? You're watching Jesus going up. The same way you see him go up, you're going to see him come back in the same way, physically, to the world. Why? Because he's wonderful. Now, the question that may run through our mind then could be, well, if Jesus is full of all these wonders, well, I want a piece of the wonder in my life. Is that, is that correct? I, I, I want him to turn some water to wine for me. I want him to raise up some things that are dead around me. That is a legitimate question. But I want to tell us one thing this morning. Do you know that the disciples that slept and wine and dined with Jesus and did everything with this wonderful man, there were many things that he did that they never understood. Do you know that not until they were about to, their boat was about to capsize, that they ran to him and said, Jesus, help us, help us, because we've been trying to help ourselves, even though he was in their boat. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Sometimes, the more room we have for Jesus in our life, the more we can experience his wonders. Are you following me? The more room we have, the more intimacy that we have. Number two, the more revelation of who he is. So in the morning when we were doing the worship and we were singing that song, Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. The reason we sang that song is that a lot of time, this wonderful Jesus can be right, right here in front of you. But all you may see may just be the religious things that they've said about him. And you may not see the wonder of his power. And if that's all that you see of him, you may experience just a little of who he is. Not that he's not wonderful. And so, the take away from this exhortation of the word of God is this. That we would desire in our heart to say, Lord, I want to see your wonder. I want to get an understanding of your wonderfulness as you are. Praise God. The Bible tells us that after Jesus resurrected, two of his disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus and they were discussing. I want to illustrate to you what it means to be with Jesus but not until God gives you a divine revelation of who you are serving, you may not really get all that you need to get about him. The two disciples were walking and they were sad, the Bible says. You know why they were sad? Because they've heard that Jesus was no longer in the tomb and they don't know where he was. And so they were like, so that's the end of Jesus? I mean, we thought he's gonna be the savior. And they were talking. And Jesus, remember the story, Jesus joined them, and all three of them were walking. And he said, what are you sad about? They asked him, are you the only stranger in this land? You, you, you mean you, did, you have not watched CNN News today, man? You didn't realize that there was a man called Jesus that died three days ago, and we went to his tomb, we cannot find him. You're asking us why we are sad about, what we are sad about. And they kept talking. And the Bible says, they didn't know it was Jesus. Now He now began through the scriptures, began to tell them over and over again everything he has said the past three and a half years about himself, how he would die and how he would resurrect. 
But still, they didn't know it was Jesus. Here is the point. In their mind, they don't know where Jesus was. Whereas the Jesus is right there talking to them. Do you know there are many believers that they say, I cannot feel Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I'm here, but your eyes need to be open. They were sad until when they sat down to eat. And the Bible says, when they broke the bread, what happened? Scripture says, their eyes were open. Were they blind? If they were blind, how were they walking? They had physical eyes, but their inner mind, their inner eyes were shut. Even though they have been following Jesus for three and a half years, they've had every sermon. That tells you that it is not that Jesus is not wonderful. But a lot of times, our inner spirit have not been open to see the wonder of this person that we are worshiping. And so, we may be cut away from experiencing the wonders of who Jesus is. That's why we sang that song. And that's, that's what I want you to make your prayer today. Open my eyes. I, if, you are, if you are all these things that have been said... I want to see you. Do you know how Jesus might have felt that? So, you guys, I'm here. I was here with you three and a half years, and after that, you thought I was lost? Really? May the Lord open our eyes. Amen. 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 And, and that's the only part of the names of Jesus I'm going to talk about today. His name is wonderful. And the moment we begin to see him full of this wonderful power, the wonderful power will begin to manifest in our lives. Praise the Lord. May I make a confession to us? It is possible that we Christians, when I say we, I'm, I'm generalizing. It is possible that if one is not careful, if your eyes are not open spiritually, Christians can be some of the saddest, most disappointed people on earth. Why? Because they are walking with Jesus, but their spirit eyes are not open to see in order to experience the wonder of the one that they are walking with. And so they're kind of walking with him that way. I don't have any church. It's the only God I should serve. But God says, no, no, no. Your life has to be different than that. You should express my power. The prayer we're going to pray today is, Lord, open my eyes. I want to see Jesus. It's, it's beyond going to church. It's beyond, you know, everything. This child that was born to us today is a wonderful King of kings, Lord of lords. And even the mother, Mary, kept wondering everything that was happening about Jesus. She kept wondering, what kind of a child is this? Until I believe finally she understand that this is not your child. This is your creator that came through you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. May we, may we begin to see the wonder of who Jesus is. Amen. Experience his power. Experience his joy. Experience is greatness. Hallelujah. Let's rise up on our feet.